Uh, so no, uh, all the speakers will be speaking for half an hour. So uh, that's a, a little bit of a, an amendment there. Um, in a moment, uh, Council Joel Reeves, Chairman of Essex County Council, will be welcoming you, and also uh, we'll have uh, some words from the Royal Lieutenant of Essex, Jennifer Tolhurst. But uh, housekeeping, if you put your phones on silent, that would be fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Just check you've done it. And this is, this is where you say, oh, I, I did that earlier. And you find you didn't, and you're the one. Um, only, I've already said uh, only water is allowed in the chamber for obvious reasons. Um, now, if we're not actually going to have a break this afternoon, what we're going to do is to crack on straight the way through all the presentations, questions, answers, and so on. I'm acutely aware that uh, some people find it quite difficult to sit for a long period of time, myself included, and you might want to go and stretch your legs. legs please do feel free to do so. Don't, don't feel you have to sit there if you're feeling uncomfortable in any way. So do feel free just to go and stretch your legs uh, at any point during the afternoon, but we will continue. Okay, so that's the way it's going to work, and I hope you don't mind. Um, there are no fire drills scheduled this afternoon, so, well, not to my knowledge, anyway. Um, so if there is an alarm, just follow me, because I'll be at the head of the queue. Um, uh, the alarm is obviously at the bottom of the stairs, if you feel so inclined. Okay, uh, is there anything else we have to do? I hope you find the afternoon really worthwhile, and it's all about motivation, isn't it? It's all about us lot getting out there and celebrating Essex and what it does. So let me introduce you to start the proceedings off uh, to the chairman of Essex County Council, Councillor Joe Williams. Joe. Thank you, Dave. Lord Lieutenant, High Sheriff, Deputy Lieutenants, Mayors and Chairmen, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is my pleasure to welcome you all here to County Hall to this important seminar on national honours and awards. I particularly want to thank our keynote speakers, Alex Pemberton, Policy Manager for the King's Award for Voluntary Services, and Abby Oshodi, Honours Secretary for the Honours and Awards team, both from the Department for Culture, Media and Sport. What you may not be aware of is that this seminar was originally planned for September last year, but was cancelled at short notice due to the death of the late Queen. I'm delighted that we have been able to reorganise the seminar and to have the key people from the respective government office to give us a better understanding of the national honours and awards system. Local authorities are inextricably linked to communities and it is within these communities that individuals, voluntary groups and businesses make an essential contribution to our life and well-being. Within our communities, there are always some who go the extra mile, some who are outstanding. <clears throat> Local authorities and those closely linked to their communities are in a prime position to be able to identify those who deserve to be considered for national recognition. I'm therefore delighted to be able to sponsor this seminar today to help us to turn those prime links into action and seek out those deserving of nomination for a national honor or award. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, just to remind you that uh, everything that happens this afternoon is going to be videoed. So if you object to that, I'll leave now. And um, the Lord of Tenet of Essex, Jennifer Tolhurst. Well, it's absolutely amazing to see you all here. Thank you very, very much indeed. Lots of familiar faces here, key people actually in the county, just as uh, Councillor Jill Reeves said. I would especially like to thank Jill for sponsoring this event. Thank you very much, Jill. It's a great to ha have the use of this venue. Uh, and um, we've got all more cons, really. We can all, all have a go at speaking when, when it comes to it, if you, if you have any questions. Um, thank you also to those who have organised the seminar, Karen Fitzpatrick and Sue Ewell, Stuart Rawlins, 
Tim Stokes and Charles Clark, who have all worked very hard putting it, put, putting it all together. You'll be hearing from Stuart and Charles as we work through the programme, and during the coming year, Tim is to take the lead on the King's Award for Voluntary Services as Charles steps aside for a well-earned rest. Can't believe he's getting to that sort of age, can you? But anyway, there it is. One of the roles of the Lord Lieutenant is to promote honours for the whole county of Essex, Southend and Thurrock and to ensure appropriate recognition of three different categories. Honouring outstanding individuals with a personal national honour, recognising and honouring excellent voluntary groups with the King's Award for Volunteers, and recognising the excellence in our business with the King's Award for Enterprise, given to those outstanding businesses who are leaders in their field. These three categories recognize those who do so much to support and enrich the lives of our communities. This afternoon is an opportunity to hear from those who promote and administer the awards at a national level and to hear how the county can best respond to the challenge of finding individuals, voluntary groups and businesses who should be nominated for consideration. And where appropriate undertaking and where appropriate undertaking assessments and making recommendations to national decision makers. I hope, though, that this afternoon will be more than just giving you a better understanding of the honours system. I want this afternoon to be a call for action. Please don't leave here today thinking, oh, that was interesting. Please will you go away from here today thinking, what can I do? What can my local authority do? And what can my organization do? What can my network do to find individuals, voluntary groups, and enterprises that deserve recognition and need to be put forward to stand a chance? You will hear from the speakers today that the hardest part of being recognized is to be nominated in the first place. Thank you. Lord Lieutenant, thank you very much indeed. Um, can we, I've no doubt that you'll have lots of questions. Um, can we ask that you keep the questions to the end of all the presentations? So we'll do the presentations first and then questions at the end, if you could just note them down, because I've no doubt you'll have loads and loads of them. Well, let's start off with the voluntary sector and the Council Award for Voluntary Service, CAVs. Um, Alex Pemberton is policy manager for CAVS uh, at the Department for Culture, Media and Sports. Alex, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. It is really lovely to be in Essex. Um, would you believe it's my first time in Essex? Um, but. Uh, and what a kind of a lovely venue to come to and speak to. Um, I am Alex Pemberton, I'm the Policy Manager for the King's Award for Voluntary Service, uh, based out of the Department of Culture, Media and Sport uh, in Whitehall. And today I'm going to speak a bit more about the award, some of the different elements of it, uh, and also hopefully kind of encourage uh, all the kind of participants here to go and spread the message um, of CAVs. Yes, yes. Um, so what is okay I'll do my best to speak up um so what is the King's Award for Launch Service also known as CAVs so it's created in 2002 to celebrate Queen Elizabeth II's golden jubilee and it's here to recognize outstanding volunteer groups from across the UK, previously known as QAV, so the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service, um, following kind of the late Queen's passing last year, uh, the King emphasised his desire to continue the award, so now it's known as the King's Award for Voluntary Service. It is the highest award for local volunteer groups from across the UK, so it's part of the honour system, equivalent to an MBE because of its local nature, and it's awarded for life, so as long as a group is continuing to do similar work, as well as um, kind of working in the same field, then they will hold this award until kind of that group ends. 
Um, the awardees were announced on the 14th of November, previously the 2nd of June for the Queen's birthday, but now the 14th of November for the King's birthday. Day. Uh, here we have a picture of uh, Prince of Wales, uh, a group called Catch Leads, which is kind of a wonderful community group um, supporting young people with their mental health, um, getting engaged in sports and also education and employment. Uh, so what are the benefits for groups? So I think it's really important to put this down to two. So there are huge benefits for being nominated. Firstly, it's identification. Uh, by members of the local community, that group is doing really good work. So if you don't know, kind of in, all nominations must be independent. So it shows that kind of the group is really well thought of in the local community. It also gives a great benefit to the volunteers. You know, it's really well respected in that capacity. And I think for lieutenancies, it's a really good way to understand the voluntary sphere in that area, understand kind of what groups are working, what groups are kind of developing, and also are there any challenges? For those groups that are rewarded, it is a mark of outstanding quality. So as mentioned, it is the highest, it is the highest award uh, in the voluntary sphere for local groups, and it is royal recognition. The list of awardees with uh, kind of citations and inscription goes to the king, and the king will formally kind of look over it and sign off it. In terms of kind of more pragmatic, uh, shall we say, benefits, having this as an award is very good for uh, funding. So I know in some northern lieutenancies such as Lancashire, Greater Manchester and Cheshire, who, um, who administered the Duchy of Lancaster Benevolent Fund, having a CAVS is a real mark of quality. And whilst it doesn't guarantee them funding, it's quite a good um, way to show their quality, shall we say. On the 14th of November, when awardees were announced. They were announced in the London, London Gazette, and we do kind of a big publicity push. They were also given an award crystal and certificate, the right to use the Cavs logo along with all their promotional material, which um, as it is, you kind of uses the King's crown, uh, a lot of groups like that. And finally, two volunteers from each group get to go to a Royal Garden party kind of the following summer. So the role of lieutenancies. So the role of lieutenancies play three key roles. Firstly is to promote. Your job is sort of to promote the award as far and as wide uh, as you can. We fully um, encourage lieutenancies to go out into the community, speak to community groups, to raise the profile of the award, and really kind of build momentum and make them aware that the King's Award for Service is out there. We try to avoid uh, enabling DLs to nominate local groups due to the conflict of interest. However, going out to speak to local voluntary groups, we're all for, and we will kind of support you uh, in every way to do that. Secondly is the local assessment. So your role is to locally kind of assess these groups. We have quite a comprehensive form. So you go out to a local group, assess it, fill out this form, and then submit it back to us, making a judgment whether to recommend or not recommend, which then we then pass on to our national committee. And then thirdly is to award. So you have the kind of great pleasure, shall we say, of going out to these awarded groups, presenting them with a crystal certificate, having a presentation, a kind of um, celebrating the successes of, the, of this group. Um, um, so CAVs are for small, large, urban, rural groups. There is no one mould essentially that fits, but there are kind of three key things. Firstly, volunteers are leading them. Secondly, huge impact on the community. And thirdly, doing something slightly different or showing initiative to kind of really solve a problem. Uh, I wanted to kind of provide some uh, example groups and example wardies for those who kind of have no concept of, of calves or kind of the types of groups. So in the bottom left, we have um, Locker to Neath. So it's a community newspaper in the West Isles. Um, quite a good read if you ever fancy reading it, but it's about um, bringing together really kind of isolated individuals kind of way out in the West Isles. Uh, we have Proband Arts. So this is a arts group that brings um, plays, theatres, books from Pakistani, Indian and Bangladeshi origin, more into the public consciousness in the West Midlands. Uh, in the kind of central bottom here, we have a Nuki Community Orchard. So lovely kind of community orchard and allotments uh, down in Cornwall that helps those with learning difficulties, those who are isolated, those who may be homeless, kind of delivering skills and kind of improving their mental health. Uh, we have the Corey Band in South Wales, um, which traditional brass band uh, has 
bands of all different ages, but also offers free tuition. So kind of going above and beyond. And then lastly, in the bottom right, we have um, Knock Me Running Club. So this is a running club in Northern Ireland, which took over disused forest, opened up lots of trails, started a running group, and essentially made it accessible to all ages, but also kind of all abilities. Um, so now just to give a kind of a brief overview of the CAVS process. So the first stage is nominations. So we receive hundreds and hundreds of nominations from the public for local community groups all across the UK. Uh, the nomination window opens on the 1st of June and closes on the 15th of September. Once we've received these, we split them up and assign them to lieutenancies all across the UK. And so and we will pass these on to the local lieutenancy. You will then carry out the local assessment, write a report, and then pass it back to us between December and March. We then um, have the, sorry, those um, local assessments which are recommended, so groups which are recommended to the national assessment, we will then pass them on to our national assessment committee, have lots of kind of subgroup committees to decide whether they should be recommended or not recommended to the king. And we will collate a list. We'll then send that list to the king over in June. Uh, and once we have his approval, um, we will start to plan our announcement for the 14th of November, which is the king's birthday. So talking a bit more about the nomination window. So nominations are submitted independently of the group. This means that any kind of volunteer, anyone involved in the running of the group is not able to submit a nomination for their, for their group. Um, they must meet a key criteria. So this is found on our website. It's fairly basic, but it includes terms such as must be made up of three or more people, must be running for three or, year, three or more years. And it's essentially just to ensure that the group is on stable footing. All forms must be completed online at uh, our website, cavs.dcms.gov.uk, where you answer a eligibility questionnaire, ask them short questions about their role, work and impact, and then two additional letters of support are kind of needed in this. It must be submitted for, for the 15th of September deadline. So you have around two and a half, three and a half months in order to submit those. And again, um, if there's any questions, you can please kind of talk to us about those. Um, talking a bit more about the nomination form. So the actual form only takes about five to 10 minutes to complete. And we are not looking for the most in-depth information ever. We are looking for a kind of general inkling into what the group does, its activities, beneficiaries, where are they based, what do they do, the benefits of the group works, why it's had such an impact, why you're recommended them, and kind of what the volunteers do. Volunteers are kind of really key to CAVs, so we really want that to be picked out and um, kind of explained why they're kind of key to the operation. This form takes about five to 10 minutes. It is not arduous, it's kind of really simple. And then in combination with this form, we ask for two letters of support. So these are letters which kind of explain from either a beneficiaries, a supporter, maybe a patron about the role of the group and why um, they think that they are supporting this nomination. We occasionally do get letters from MPs, mayors. Um, however, unless they have direct experience with the group, we ask that you... Um, letters of support don't come from these individuals. This is because the best letters of support are where they tell us a real story, kind of a human story about what's going on, how you've been affected, and why you are supporting this nomination for this group. In total, these letters of support can take kind of a week or two to collect, as you um, often need to know somebody who is connected to the group but independent. So in total, um, completing the form takes 10 minutes, and then these letters of support Kind of take a little bit of time to collate, but we've tried to make this as simple as and kind of arduous and unarduous as possible. So there are lots of kind of um, aspects to calves and what makes calves group, but I'm going to go through five main criteria that we're all looking for in all groups. The first is volunteer led. So volunteers are in the driving seat, setting the direction. They operate at all levels of the hierarchy of the group, depending on the kind of the scale or scope. And we're always developing opportunities to go further, to get more people involved, um, to engage from a diverse set of backgrounds. And this is kind of the key element of CAVS. It's about volunteer-led um, groups, and it's really about recognising the volunteers at the heart of it. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we have making a difference. So you know groups around which are making a huge difference in their local area. They're having a significant contribution to the lives of beneficiaries, and without them, actually, they would leave a bit of a hole in kind of that community and that ecosystem. 
Thirdly, it's about well-run. So high standards of governance, financial management, and especially if working with children, safeguarding policies in place. I think the key thing here is that um, governance should be proportional to the size of the group. So often we get very small groups that are made up of a couple of volunteers. They may be kind of way north in Scotland, just a bunch of friends who are cleaning up beaches. Or we may have a huge CIC in the centre of London with hundreds of volunteers. Obviously, we would not expect the governance of those organisations to be equal, but we expect, you know, for the very small um, group, kind of some spreadsheets, just about that ingoings, outgoings, and then for the large CIC, kind of detailed financial management plans, policies and safeguarding. So it's really about proportionality to the scale of the group. But um, governance is really important because, as you know, the award is in the name of the king, so I'll come back to this in the future. We need to ensure that every group kind of is up to scratch and up to muster. Um, thirdly, sorry, fourthly is outstanding reputation. So the group will have an outstanding reputation with the public, its beneficiaries, um, any statutory bodies that it works with. And um, you will often know that actually there's kind of a great sense of what this group can do in the community and how it's and how it's um, kind of thought of. And then lastly, exceptionality, which is quite hard to define, but this group is likely to be one of best of its kind in this country when um, looked at in comparison to similar groups. I think the thing to say this is on a county scale, it's like really difficult to know what exceptionality stands. And this is um, sort of where we rely on our judgment, our national assessor's judgments. However, I can reassure that context, so rurality, uh, deprivation, difficult conditions are all taken into uh, consideration. So um, context really matters when it comes to exceptionality. So once we've received all the nominations, um, we often get kind of 500 to 600 nominations from across the UK, so quite a few. We will check each for eligibility to ensure that they meet our eligibility criteria, to ensure that they meet kind of some of our policy points, and to ensure that they're, you know, they're about volunteers rather than paid staff um, kind of really working this um, for, sorry, uh, for the award. Each lieutenancy will then receive nominations for that area. So you receive all the nominations for Essex, and then it's your role to assess these to either recommend or not recommend. The point of the local assessment is essentially to do four things. Firstly, to check that. Check that actually the group is a real group and it's doing what it says it's doing. You will not believe that actually occasionally we get groups that are completely fabricated. And so um, we, do, we need to kind of send these out to you and check that they're real. Secondly, it's to gather extra evidence. So with each local assessment, you have quite a detailed form. Each question has help text covering governance, exceptionality, the role of the volunteers, paid staff breakdown, how long it's been going for kind of work with statutory bodies. And it's your role to kind of gather this extra, extra evidence and to really pull out the information from the group of what they're doing and relate this back to us. Thirdly, it's about due diligence. Again, it's in the name of the king, so we need to ensure that all groups have uh, strong kind of governance, financial management, um, but also public perception that the group are well respected and that if this group were to be awarded, then there would be no issues either for kind of the King's Award, the Royal Household or like any lieutenancy around the UK. And lastly, it's about judgment. So your judgment is really key. At the end of the local assessment, you will either make a judgment to recommend or not recommend to the National uh, Assessment Committee. A group will never know at which stage they get to, so please don't worry about kind of not recommending them or recommending them. But every recommended group, if you think it should be, go to the National Assessment and it fits the criteria, then that's kind of in your hands and we leave that up to you. So carry out the local assessment. So we notify all groups um, in kind of late November um, of how many groups they have um, and then on the 1st of December, the local assessment starts. We produce um, some guidance for Lord Lieutenants and call all Deputy Lieutenants. And this is about kind of 50 to 60 pages long. So it's very thorough. It gives a step-by-step -step kind of analysis of how to carry out a local assessment. But should you have any questions on this, again, we're always here to help you. Then you need to get access to our CAVS admin site. So this is where the local assessment will be completed. You can download templates from there, but every form will be uploaded onto um, kind of our website. This is a standardized form. So for every single group, it will be exactly the same. 
you, before the assessment, you can download the group information, local assessment form. And this year, we're putting together a introductory documents to hand to every group to introduce them to the award, um, what the local assessment will kind of con consist of, and also kind of next steps. Then you arrange a visit, usually kind of over an afternoon, but it can potentially take one or two days, depending on um, kind of circumstances. And then you complete the assessment, submit it, and kind of send it back to us. Once you've made a decision, either to not recommend or recommend, all the recommended groups will be passed on to the National Committee. So this, our National Committee is made up of 27 experts across voluntary, social enterprise, third sector. They're all across all stages of their career. So some are still working, some are retired, and all based like across the UK. Um, for example, on the screen here, we have Sir Martin Lewis, who's kind of the chairman of the award. Sandra Ajay used to be the ex-head of Volunteer Northern Ireland. Harris Bakari has just become the chair of uh, NCS, I think, National Citizen Service. Uh, Ruth Bravery uh, used to be senior civil servant and works now uh, leading kind of a foundation in London. So the very kind of, um, sorry, got lots of experience, but also really key um, to voluntary and kind of community groups um, and that sphere. Each group will be independently assessed by three or more of our national assessors. So each group will be looked at independently by three of them, and then we'll come together at a subgroup committee meeting to discuss the group, to kind of talk about whether it should be recommended, not recommended, are there any issues reputationally, has due diligence been completed, do we need any more information from the Lord Lieutenancy? And then we will either decide to recommend or not recommend them to the King. Once we have that final list, um, we will then pass it on to the King for his approval. Um, and kind of in mid-September, we usually get approval uh, of that list. As this is the first year of the King's kind of, the first iteration of the King's Award for Voluntary Service, we've just received the list for this year. So I will share that kind of shortly. Uh, we then contact successful groups by email in, all, in early October. And um, we do this in order to kind of uh, prepare case study material, but also to ensure that they are kind of talking, sorry, not talking, but um, preparing kind of press releases with local newspapers, and if we need to do anything on a national scale. Then in early November, we contact unsuccessful groups by a physical letter. We think this works really well. You know, I think being nominated for the King's Award is a great achievement in itself, and we're really working hard to not um, dismay any kind of volunteers who are part of an unsuccessful group. We really want to encourage them to keep doing what they're doing. It just They just may not be completely exceptional on a UK scale. Then on the 14th of, 14th of November, we have an announcement. Um, last year, we were kind of trending second, I think, on Twitter. So we're really keen to promote, to show, to encourage as many groups to like, talk about their experiences of the King's Award, to recognise them. Um, and this is across mainly social media, local newspaper. And this year, we are trying to kind of uh, get op-eds in kind of national newspapers as well. Then between November and March, Lord Lieutenant presentations to the group. So each Lord Lieutenant would go out to the groups, do a presentation, provide their crystal and certificate to kind of recognise the group. And then the following May, we have the garden parties at either Buckingham Palace or Palace of Holyrood. Um, I wanted to give kind of a flavour of some of the successful groups from Essex. So we have um, Brentwood Imperial, Youth Band, Aberton Royal Trade and Citizens Advice, South End, Kids Inspire, Essex Search and Rescue. So these are groups that have been awarded over the past three or four years. And the key thing that I want to say is that every single one of these groups is different. They do a different thing. They, you know, operate in a different way. They are on different scales, but they've all been awarded the King's Award. And I think this is kind of what's really key is that there is no one fit group. You know, if a group is volunteer led, if it is doing really good voluntary work in your local sector, in your local community, and um, kind of you feel it's really good, then please kind of encourage them to be nominated and we can recognise them via this way. On a more national scale, on the left-hand side, you have some of the areas which we recognise groups in. Again, this is not exhaustive. So one group may be you know, really focused on armed forces or actually it may be armed forces and kind of arts and media as a combination. There is no, again, one combination of group. We cover the whole spectrum and anything that you propose to us, we will uh, evaluate it and either judge it whether to recommend or not recommend to the king. On the 
right hand side you can see kind of the spread from across the uk so we get all groups from across the uk from kind of most northern scotland this year we've just received some recommendations from orkney for the first time which is kind of really good um but we're really keen about recognizing all communities all backgrounds rural urban um high levels of deprivation um, and context is really important to us. So we do take that into account. If you explain it to us, the national assessors really kind of look for that. Um, yeah. Um, so there was a slide missing. It's gone kind of somewhere, but we don't really know. Um, and it's just about presentations. So once a recommended group has been awarded, um, the lieutenancy then will go to a presentation. This is where you present the certificate in Crystal. And usually it's a really good uh, way to kind of recognize the group's volunteers. It's also a really good way to kind of promote and encourage those groups' volunteers to keep, what, to keep doing what they're doing, but also to go out into the local community and promote uh, CAF. So what usually happens is uh, once a group has been recognized, CAF, their volunteers will go out and speak to other groups about CAF. And it's a really good way to build those momentums. Um, Presentations wise, you can do however you like. Usually it may be a sit down kind of tea and coffee, or it could be kind of an evening do. We've had presentation on boats, on beaches, um, all sorts of things. So um, yeah, we really will kind of encourage these to be as well. And we, and as the central team, we will also do our best to kind of share these on social media, to write articles and kind of promote the work that you do. Um, in terms of promoting cabs, uh, our Twitter and Facebook candles are a King's Award voluntary service. Uh, I know that there are kind of certain limitations on what a lieutenancy can post or kind of retweet on Twitter and Facebook. Um, but over the coming year, um, we're kind of really going to try and, and step this up. And so use Twitter and Facebook to promote the award, but also provide you with more resources. So whether that's social media, um, physical leaflets, um, presentations that you can go out and deliver on a smaller scale to groups. That is our aim for the upcoming year. Um, more information can be found on our website. Uh, so just type in King's World Launch Service at Google, kingsworlddcms.gov.uk. It has lots of information about the award, past awardees. So if you're unsure whether a group will fit or you just want some inspiration, we have all our past awardees going back 20 years on there. The awards process, so timeline, kind of what happens at each stage, but also our National Assessments Committee. So if you want to have a bit more look at our National Assessment Committee, please go on there. Volunteering, so links to do it, but also um, kind of volunteering bodies in Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, and how to get involved in volunteering. And then news where um, over the upcoming year, we hope to populate with blogs about what's going on around the UK with regards to CALS groups. And then finally, making a nomination and submitting a nomination. Um, that is the end of my presentation. Uh, I appreciate that there may be quite a lot of questions. I think there's time later. Um, but yeah, I just want to say, firstly, thank you very much for kind of listening today. Secondly, and kind of secondly, and probably more importantly, um, we know kind of the incredible work that lieutenancies do regarding CAVs. You are an integral part of this. And we do um, kind of really value the work and also your comments and suggestions on how we improve the award. So, um, just want to say thank you from kind of on behalf of the team, on behalf of kind of Sir Martin. Um, and yeah, should you have any ever any comments, suggestions on how we could be doing things better, then please do contact us as they will be kind of very warmly received. Okay, thank you. Alex, thank you very much indeed. And uh, as Alex said, there will be plenty of time for questions at the end. So that's the voluntary sector. Let's move on now to individual awards. And joining us is the um, Honours Secretary uh, from the Honours and Awards team at the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, Abby Oshodu. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Abby Oshodi, and I'm one of the Honours Secretaries at DCMS. Um, the aim of this presentation is to give you a whistle-stop tour of DCMS's role in the Honours process and ultimately to encourage you to nominate worthy individuals for honours. Um, as everyone said, please save any questions for later and I'll answer them as best as I can. So, as I've said, I'm one of the two honours secretaries in DCMS. My core honours secretary is um, Rachel Knight. She's responsible for at some media, sports and state committees. 
And I'm responsible for community voluntary service. So this is quite apt that I came after Alex. I'm also responsible for the economy committee and also public service committee. Um, so Rachel and I have two deputy honor secretaries who work alongside us and they are responsible for logging nominations, dealing with public correspondence and liaising with lieutenancies and um, other external stakeholders for validation. So for example, one of the committees is public service and in that, on that committee, my, my, my role is to ensure that scouts, guides, brownies are recognized. So when I get nominations for those people, I then get my deputy to reach out to the scouts, the guides, brownies for validation. And same way with public nominations, I will come to the Lord Lieutenant for validation as well. Rachel and I are also responsible for sifting public nominations. Sorry, go back a slide. <laughs> so we're responsible for sifting public nominations as well. We also prepare the list of nominations for our senior managers in the department for submission to cabinet office. We also brief um, our PERMSEC and other senior managers, and we do a lot of stakeholder management as well. And um, more importantly, we draft citations. So the nominations that people put in, we then have to turn them into citations, which is what is seen by cabinet office. And also we get the opportunity to attend outreach events like this to talk about the honor system. Next slide, please. So um, DCMS, as I've said, we um, are actually the biggest a contributor of on um, nominations to cabinet office. So we submit between 500 and 600 nominations every round. We get about a thousand nominations every year from members of the public. And because there are a total number of slots available for each committee, it means that obviously honors are on like calves honours, you know, individual honours are tightly fought for. So which is why, again, it's very, very important that honours nominations, when they're put together, they reflect the best of the individual. So for example, um, I'll give you a um, flavour of what um, one of my committees, Community Voluntary Service, what we do. So CVS is mainly for local level nominees. And um, we put forward quite a lot of awards at MBE, BEM level. And um, so these include a large number of volunteers and charitable fundraisers. I work very closely with Alex. So Alex deals with groups, I deal with individuals. So I think in the um, CAVS nomination form, there's a section there for, you know, you pick out any outstanding individuals in groups. And that's when I come in and I, swoop down and take these people for my list. Next slide, please. So uh, for example, um, on CVS, there are 420 awards available. And of course, you know, we have, you know, CVS comprises of volunteers, philanthropists, charity, people that work in heritage, and on average, we will submit about 180 nominations. For public service, there are only 167 awards available for that committee. And we tend to submit between 75 and 80 nominations. And as, as I've said before, public service for our side, we deal with all the youth policy, uh, uniformed youth organizations, and uh, the Department for Leveling Up, Housing and Communities, DLOC, is actually the lead department on public service. So I should have said, DCMS is the lead department for CVS committee. And on the economic committee, my other committee, there are about 137 awards available. And um, so for DCMS, this is things like the advertising industry, film, fashion, tourism, and the tech sector used to be in DCMS, but that has now been moved out to two other government departments. And on average, we submit between 30 to 40 nominations. Next slide, please. So what is the importance of honours to DCMS? 
honors are a vital tool to recognize the great work that's been done in our, in our sectors in DCMS. So our permanent secretary is actually one of the hardest working officials in terms of honors, because she sits on three committees. So she sits on the ATSA Media, Sport and CVS committees. And um, as I've said before, our input into the system is considerable. So we submit between 550, 600 nominations every single round. So there are two rounds, the New Year Honours List and then the King's Birthday. So as we do all this work, we obviously have the PM's input as well. So the PM sets the strategic agenda for honours. So we, and as we're assessing nominations, we have to ensure that we are looking at the PM's agenda and also our ministers as well, they have an input into the system as well. So one of the big things that um, is always constant is about leveling up. So we try to ensure that our nominations cover the whole span of the country. Next slide, please. So I've just given you um, an idea of the kind of strategic priorities we're working towards for this round and the next round. So it's things like people who provide high quality responsive healthcare, those who deliver the highest possible standards in education, those who deliver meaningful change locally in tackling crime and improving their community, those who support families to contribute to society and help children achieve their potential, public servants, and also entrepreneurs and innovators who create thriving businesses and deliver growth across the country. And lastly, philanthropists and those who give their expertise and help support public sector, cultural and charitable institutions. I should make very clear now that that last one, philanthropist, doesn't have any bearing at all on the whole cash for honours. So most times, you know, when honours are, when they're, when they're um, announced, philanthropists actually choose, because you can decide how you want your short citation to be reflected. Philanthropists actually will say that they don't want any mention at all of the philanthropy in their short citation. So, you know, so that, that that's just to make clear that, you know, I know when honours are announced, the press will jump on the bandwagon and go on about, you know, people paying cash for honours. That's not true. Next slide, please. So which awards are available? So um, we tend to work in um, awards in the order of the British Empire. So, I mean, I think this explains all the different levels, but there's just a, a something at the end. So the companion of honor is something that we also work on. So obviously this is limited to only 65 recipients at any one time. There are currently actually two spaces. So sadly, somebody has to pass away for somebody else to be, <laughs> to go on the, um, on the list. So, but I mean, if you've got any questions about all the different levels, I'm very happy to take those at the end because I know they can be quite confusing, but I, I won't go through them all now for you. Next slide, please. So what happens when you put in a nomination? So once you've identified somebody who is deserving of an honor, you complete a nomination form, which can be found on the www.honours.gov.uk site. So that site actually is administered by Cabinet Office. So the Honours and Appointment Secretariat in Cabinet Office is responsible for the administration of the honours system. So all public nominations will go to them in the first instance. But what, what we're finding now is the public are becoming very savvy. And so if somebody nominates somebody, I don't know, um, somebody who set up a sports club, they know they can send that to us directly in DCMS. So we can get public nominations as well, but in the first instance, they should all be sent to cabinet office. So once cabinet office receives your nomination, they will then decide which government department is best suited to um, assessing the nomination. So again, as I've said, we get quite a lot of nominations coming back to us from cabinet office. So cabinet office will then forward the nomination to the appropriate department so, for example, as I've said, grassroots sports, 
actors, charity fundraisers, scout leaders will be sent to us in DCMS for consideration. Side, please. So once we receive the um, nomination from cabinet office, we will assess them against the others that we've received in our department. So when I say the others that we've received, so at the start of each honors round, we will, our perm sec will go out to all our stakeholders and invite them to nominate people. So then once we get all the nominations from the cabinet office, our internal and external stakeholder nominations, we will then, so Rachel and I will then do something called sifting when we go through every single nomination and then decide the strongest ones. And then in conjunction with senior managers, we then decide the best list possible to go forward to cabinet office. And then these lists are then sent to cabinet office for consideration by the independent honours committees who make the final decision. So if your nomination has been forwarded to us in DCMS or any other government departments by cabinet office, you'll be informed. And um, a new thing cabinet office are doing actually is they will actually tell nominators the name of the department and for them to contact the department directly for any progress reports. So nominations that are not taken forward to a committee can be added to the pool of candidates to be considered for a Royal Guardian Party list. So we keep a running list of candidates that are not strong enough to go forwards for an honor. And as I said, we come to the Lord Lieutenants for validation. So Lord Lieutenants can tell us either to, yes, this is a very strong case, we support, we rate them, you know, they're outstanding. Or the Lord Lieutenants might say, actually, this is a very local case. We've done our investigations and we think they're best suited for a Royal Guardian Party. So each lieutenancy has their own Guardian Party list as well. And we have our own list as well. But, you know, Buckingham Palace is responsible for the uh, Guardian Party. So there's never any chance that somebody will be on two different lists. They will always know and tell us. So if your candidate is successful for an honor, for example, they'll be contacted by the cabinet office because they're obviously responsible for the publication of the New Year and Birthday Honours Lists. Next slide, please. So I just thought I'd give you an example of what a citation form looks like. So the nomination form obviously is completely different from this. The nomination form is about, I think about 10 pages. Very simple questions, very straightforward. And then once we get all that information, our job in the Honours team is then to produce a citation for that person. So it means going through each nomination, looking at the letters of support and you know, making sure that we've captured all the information, you know, all the relevant information, and you know, just doing a good job for that person. I get very invested in my community voluntary service nominations, and I it's not best practice, but I've been known to stay up till about midnight writing citations because I just want to do the best for all my candidates. Next slide, please. So um, that's it for uh, individual nominations. I'm very happy to take any questions when we take the questions. But, you know, if you have any more questions or anything you want to know, please, you're welcome to email us at the email address there. And I'll be very happy to answer your questions then. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abby. Thank you very much. Um, now let's move on to enterprise and the King's Award for Enterprise. And uh, it's good to welcome former Chief Executive of E2V Technologies in Chelmsford to talk about the benefits of actually getting this award. Uh, welcome to Keith Atwood. Keith. Thank you, Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay at the back, Vincent? Grand. So, first slide. Um, could I go back one, please? Thank you. So, I'm, I'm here today to talk to you about the King's Award for Enterprise. Um, um, I'm talking with some authority, the company I ran, ETV Technologies, has won, I think, since 
the inception of the scheme, something north of 10. Um, and while I was CEO, I was lucky enough to win three, what was then Queen's Awards. Um, and it's a very powerful tool for us, as a, as a, particularly as an international business, has global recognition, national recognition, and I consider it to be the preeminent award that any business can win. Next slide, please. So the awards were instituted by Royal Warrant back in 1965 by the Queen, obviously recently renamed the King's Awards uh, uh, for Enterprise, and this reflects uh, the King's uh, intent to continue to uh, uh, support the Queen's legacy in recognising outstanding UK businesses. Um, there are four categories, um, the first being innovation, um, this is looking for commercially successful, innovative products and or services. International trade, which I think is um, self-explanatory. Uh, clearly, it's very good for UK PLC for us to be selling products abroad. Uh, and uh, the, the, this particular category was designed to recognise that. And uh, a businesses that can demonstrate substantial growth in uh, overseas earnings uh, are welcome to apply to that. As society has evolved, the, the categories have developed too. Um, and so there's two relatively recent new categories, sustainable development, uh, which is looking at sustainability in its broadest sense, both in products, services, or other interve interventions that an organization might make. Um, and so long as a, those interventions have been happening for a, a period of two plus years, and there's proper evidence to support those in the, the results of those interventions, um, there's a good chance of winning an award for sustainable development. And um, the final one, the fourth one, promoting opportunity through social mobility. And this is looking at high quality social mobility initiatives aimed at people from disadvantaged backgrounds. So helping people to move from perhaps a place they would rather not be to a place where they perhaps would rather be. Um, as you know, the UK and indeed Essex is full of lots of exciting and innovative businesses, and uh, th this particular awards scheme is a great way of celebrating their success. Um, the difference I think that's worth pointing out here is this is a self-nominating process. The other schemes we've heard about, um, you some, somebody has to be nominated or an organisation has to be nominated. If you run a business, you can nominate yourself for, for, for these particular awards. Next slide, please. Um, the eligibility criteria are not particularly difficult. Um, UK-based, uh, uh, behave properly with HMRC, uh, so a, a, a good record of compliance. Uh, Self-contained, only two UK employees, that's sufficient or part-time equivalent. And, and be able to demonstrate strong corporate social responsibility. Now, each of the four categories I mentioned in the previous slide do have their own criteria. And of course, as you'd expect, they're, they're quite detailed and I don't plan to spend any time on explaining those at the moment, but all of it is available on the uh, 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 gov.uk site. Um, and if you would like to take a look, feel free to do so. Next slide, please. So the cycle has actually just closed. Um, it was due to close um, for applications on the 12th of September, opening on the uh, King's coronation on the 6th of May. Actually, I can tell you that because there's been such a successful year in generating applications, um, they kept the door open an extra day. So it actually was open until the 13th of September. Thereafter, there's a very, very thorough and rigorous assessment of those entries uh, between September and October. Um, and, this, and because of this assessment process is so detailed and thorough, this is one of the reasons why the award is held in such high regard uh, across the world. Um, those that pass through that assessment um, uh, process will then be subject to a fairly detailed due diligence phase. Uh, as you can imagine, the King is not interested in putting his name into any organization um, who isn't credible, sensible, properly managed, appropriately uh, uh, diligent themselves.
themselves in, in what they do, um, and, and that process is intended to ensure that is the case. Then an expert panel of judges will sit and review each of those applications that get through that next stage um, during the course of January, January and February, and the winners will be approved in March. They will get to hear about it then and announced again on the King's uh, coronation date of the 6th of May. Next slide, please. So the two, uh, 2023 King's Awards recipients, which as you can imagine, because of the transition to um, uh, uh, His Majesty the King, um, were actually announced on the Queen's birthday. Uh, there were 149 award winners uh, for, for 2023, one double awardee. 91% of recipients are SMEs. And I think some people get a little bit confused by this scheme and think it's intended for big businesses. It is absolutely is not. It's intended for all businesses. And as you can see, um, a number of uh, recipients are SMEs and 23 of which have less than 10 employees. Next slide, please. Um, I won't read the numbers, but international trade has been around as probably the longest category for the award scheme. Um, and, and that in part explains why there's so many in that particular category. Uh, but it's nice to see the newer uh, uh, categories of sustainable development and promoting opportunity um, beginning to shine through. Um, so that's excellent. Um, just go back one slide, please. Um, before I move on, I, I'd just like to talk about so what's happening in Essex. Um, well, I can tell you in 2023, we had eight applicants and no winners which was very disappointing for Jenny and myself. Um, however, I can also tell you that with the very strong support of Essex County Council, the boroughs, the districts, and also I have to acknowledge the support and work of um, Essex Chamber of Commerce as well. Uh, this year's application numbers, the, the door has just closed, as I mentioned on the 13th, there are 33 businesses that have applied this year. Um, for us, that represents a 400 plus percent increase year on year. And nationally, the increase is 64%. So it's actually a tremendous achievement. And to, for those of you who have been involved, thanks so much. And uh, I'm looking forward to celebrating the success of some of those winners when they come through um, next May. Next slide. So why would you do it? Well, uh, clearly you get to carry the royal emblem. You can do that on your products. You can do it on your stationery. You can do it on your, your vans. Um, you can fly a flag outside your uh, business. Um, and uh, you can do the same for five years. So once you're a winner, you've got five years to make the most of it. Um, a representative of the company will get invited to a reception hosted by the king. Um, and uh, in Essex, Jenny would present uh, the majority of the wards, I think, Jenny. Let, let's hope you're very busy next uh, uh, spring. Um, and, and I can tell you from my own experience, uh, the winning of this award is a great opportunity to celebrate the success of your business, not only with your teams, um, and, and it's a good staff morale booster, but also with your stakeholders, your other uh, partners, your customers, your supply chain. Uh, so it creates an, an excellent platform for marketing, uh, strengthening your brand internationally. Um, and and th there are a number of businesses who have uh, reported increased sales growth and interest as a consequence of winning this award. So it's real and practical and tangible benefits for businesses. Next slide. So I thought you rather than listen to me, you might want to listen to some past winners talking about their experiences. Thank you. The, the, the King's Award is really about your business, your stakeholders, your employees. And I can't emphasize, emphasize that enough. It's, it's way more than just a standard recognized industry award. It goes beyond that. These are real uh, helpful indicators to say, well, these are quality uh, marks of excellence. 
how do we uh, how do we strive to to achieve those uh, I think one of the best lessons uh, that you know I have is uh, applying twice and failing once. Definitely, it's had a positive effect on our employees' motivation and engagement. Um, it's, just, it's excitement, it's enthusiasm, it's collaborative, um, people feel included uh, and they feel that they're part of something where innovation is nurtured and celebrated at all levels of the organisation. So. You know, from from our point of view, we couldn't be more passionate about it, and I would definitely encourage any Essex business thinking about it to to really take the plunge. Well, I hope you heard some some of that. I'll, I'll summarise. It's great. Okay, it's a really good thing. Really good for our teams. Really good for our businesses. So, apologies for the sound problems there. Next slide. Next slide. So. Um, Within Essex, as well as the, uh, the support of uh, the County Council and the District and Borough Councils um, and Essex Chamber of Commerce, I maintain a panel of past winners. Um, why are past winners important? Well, first of all, all businesses want to know that putting effort into something is worth that effort. And my panel of past winners, some of which you've nearly heard, um, uh, uh, would do a great job in supporting, talking to, uh, uh sharing their own experiences with potential applicants um i'm here as well to support support potential applicants and as again i'm a past winner so i can do very much the same thing that's all my contact details the uh the e email address and telephone number there and also the contact num uh, e number and email address for the king's award office in london so next slide and as I said, it's a great opportunity for people to celebrate their success, um, a great opportunity to mark your business out as a different kind of organisation uh, relative to its competitors. And uh, I commend the scheme to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Well, um, at the moment, we want to aspire to be here, but where are we? Where are we in Essex at the moment? Well, let's have a look at that. First of all, let's hear from the chair of the Essex Cavs panel, Charles Clark. Charles. Good afternoon, one and all. I hope you can again hear me at the back. Yeah, good. Um, I'm going to tell you what we do here in Essex to uh, uh, add on to uh, what Alex has told us about uh, what was the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service. The QAVS is now the King's Award for Voluntary Services. Next slide, please. Um, you've heard some of this from Alex. The uh, the Queen's Award was established in 2002, and uh, initially the Lord Lieutenant and the Vice Lord Lieutenant were the assessors. Um, so Lord Peter and his Deputy uh, Vice Lord Lieutenant would go around and visit these groups. At the beginning of it, there was only very few nominated groups, so that was uh, probably a very nice thing for the Lord Lieutenant and the Vice Lord Lieutenant to do go and visit these groups and have a cup of tea with them and chat about what it is they do. Um, I was invited to uh, uh, take on this role um, by Lord Peter. Um, and when he, in 2010, he, and he said to me that, Charles, the word, the DL at the end means do little. He lied to me as far as, it, as the Queen Water Voluntary Services word. Uh, uh, relates to, um, but I had a, a was able to uh, uh, 
Garn and Jenny to come along and help me. So Jenny and I actually started off the, the new way of looking at the, the Queen's Water Voluntary Services um, back in, in those days. And um, we took on this task. Other counties were getting much more groups nominated than us. So uh, I uh, came and had a conversation with uh, Lord Peter. Um, and uh, then we spoke to Staffordshire, who were the best county by far in the country. Actually, they had paid staff, county council staff running their uh, Queen's Water Voluntary Services. But uh, they established a panel of all the key people. So that's what we did. And we used to meet around uh, Jenny's uh, dining room table. Um, and uh, we used to have two, uh, that's the panel, people from the, the, the Unitary Authorities, Essex Community Foundation, Royal Community Council for Essex, the CVS's uh, Essex Police, they cover the county, and others closely connected to the voluntary sector. We've now got 12 Deputy Lieutenants who uh, are on the panel, uh, and they are our main assessors. Um, and until, uh, whilst it was the Queen's Award of Voluntary Services, where the announcement was on the 2nd of June, we used to have two panel meetings a year. Uh, one in January, about that time, where by the end of January, you had to have your recommendations in, and then a promotions meeting in, in the summer. So uh, that's how we started off the, the new way of doing things. When uh, I went back to John Peter and told him about what Staffordshire do, he said, well, we haven't got any money. So uh, next slide, please. Oh, no, we are on the next slide, yeah. We haven't got any money. So perhaps you'd like to go and talk to uh, John Aldridge, who was the, then the chairman of the county council. Perhaps they can help. You're responsible for all this, John Aldridge. Um, so uh, staff also held a reception where they brought together all the key people connected to the voluntary sector, mayors, chairs, local authorities. Um, and um, we, under John's uh, kind sponsorship from the County Council, we held our uh, first reception in the spring of 2018. Um, the uh, local authorities have been great supporters of this, of this award, uh, right from the inception of us uh, starting to take on uh, a, a, a new way of doing things. You can't see everything on that slide about the High Sheriff's Awards, but one of the, the High Sheriff, uh, probably in most counties, have an annual award. In Essex, it's to award groups who do good things in community safety. Um, through working with high sheriffs, we managed to incorporate into the thinking for the Queen's Award for Voluntary Services, those groups who would be eligible and who'd won the High Sheriff's Award. So actually, I don't think any other county does that. Uh, Lancashire do it now because we've told them what we do. But uh, so that is a very uh, useful um, aspect to nominations. I know from the work we've done this year with the High Sheriff uh, through Essex Community Foundation and Essex Police, uh, seven nominations, no, eight nominations uh, are in the pipeline waiting for Alex and his team to uh, say that they're um, eligible. Next slide, please. We had our first reception in 2018. These are the number of nominations and the number of awards. Look at the difference. Our first reception. Uh, back here, um, John Peter and the Vice Lord Lieutenant were doing their, their best here. We took over and then we had the reception and look at the difference. Um, that, 2022 is COVID. This year we've got 16 groups nominated and hopefully 16 winners but uh, probably not quite that our success rate is pretty good our success rate overall is 72.5 percent against a national uh, success rate of around 55 percent so whatever we've been doing here in Essex is it seems to be working quite well and um, 
Alex, I'm sure will tell you, and his predecessors, we've had got a pretty good relationship with the office, haven't we? Which is uh, something we work hard at. But there are over 10,000 voluntary groups across Essex and, and South End and Thurrock. We're one of the largest counties, so you would expect us to have a good number of nominated groups. The hardest thing is to get nominated. And the process is not that difficult. So, uh, and I know from this year, when I look at the, uh, they're going through the process because the closing date is only just finished, isn't it? 15th of September. Uh, they're going through the process. We've currently got three groups nominated on our website. I know we've got another seven in the pipeline. So we're already up to about 10 and I'm sure there will be more. So hopefully, we're going to maintain our, our sort of uh, role at the, towards the top end of the counties in the country. Next slide, please. So what do we do here in Essex? Well, once the groups have been nominated, um, we send them a, a questionnaire. Uh, the questionnaire gives us an enormous amount of the information that we need for the actual final assessment form. In some, some ways, I think if they're a bit more diligent in responding to this, they could be writing their own assessment for us. But uh, we get lots of information from the group before we even go and visit them. And then two assessors from our panel go and visit the group. Ladies and gentlemen, that is one of the great pleasures of doing this work because you go and find things you didn't even know existed or, or, or could exist. Small groups doing fabulous things. I, quite a few of assessors are in this room and nodding their heads here. I'm standing down as the chair of the uh, uh, this panel this, uh, this year, but I'm going to continue to be an assessor because uh, it's, a, it's a, an honour and a privilege to go and see the work of some of these groups. And uh, um, that's one of the best parts. We then share all the assessments with the whole of the panel because very often we've got people who know something about these groups and can add to the final assessment. Um, and then Stuart Rawlings, former editor of the local countywide newspaper, looks at the citations because those 600 word citations are quite important, I would imagine, for the final assessment who've got a whole stack like this to go through. So. Stuart Rawlings gives us a once over on the final citations of the assessment form. We share this, that with the Lord Lieutenant, who has to obviously be uh, satisfied that with all our outcomes. Very often the Lord Lieutenant is on the panel, not always, but uh, and then we send our recommendations in. It was in January, but uh, that's now changed with the change of date for the King's Award coming forward. One uh, comment, because you know, one of one of the reasons of holding this seminar today is to try and get everybody here and others to go out here enthused about finding groups and nominating uh, people for national honours. And when uh, Alex talks about volunteer-led, and that's really important. That's one of the big issues you have to get across uh, when you're doing an assessment. Most voluntary groups have got boards of volunteers. So this strategic thrust of the volunteer aspect in the organisation, if they have a board of volunteers, that provides you the emphasis for your volunteer-led. I know it has to bleed right through the organisation as well, but don't, you know, don't be put off if the group you're thinking about, oh, I think, oh, they don't seem to be that much, you know, volunteer-led. They're sort of, you know, the volunteers are doing fantastic work down here. But invariably, they've got a board who's set in the strategic direction. And that's a big issue in relation to these assessments. One of the things that Abby told me was virtually her responsibility was uh, um, including in the uh, King's Award for Voluntary Services assessment uh, a specific question about are there individuals in this group who deserve an uh, uh, individual honour? That is a really another way of actually promoting individual honours. So, uh, well done, Abby. That's a, a, real, a real positive, I think, for uh, this assessment process. Next slide, please.
Well, it used to be once the results were made public on the 2nd of June, but now they're going to be made public on the 14th of November. Um, as Alex told you, groups who won the award and the Lord Lieutenant get to know who the winners are before the date uh, for um, formal publication. And we then work with those groups to do a local press release. We liaise with the national office to incorporate anything they want to do to promote it nationally. And we uh, share that press release across all the local authority outlets uh, and so on to try and make the most of um, uh, the winners in the county. Um, that's, that's a very nice thing to do. And every time the, you talk to the winning groups, they're so keen to tell you how good this is to win this award. And we put their individual quotes in the, in the press release. Um, the crystals and certificates signed by the King come to the Lord Lieutenant. Um, we make the arrangements for individual presentations with the Lord Lieutenant's diary. Sometimes the Lord Lieutenant is not available, so we have very able standing Deputy Lieutenants, one or two of them I can see here, who really enjoy the presentation events. They're lovely events, the presentation events, because they are actually organised by the groups. Um, I always really tell them exactly what they can expect. But some of these presentations are really heartwarming. Uh, I can recall a first responders group where one of the people who spoke at the, uh, uh, at the event had his life saved in his hall by the first responders turning up and defibrillating him. And, you know, so you have that lovely emotional local sense of people doing really thick, excellent things on the ground. Uh, and, uh, of course, the Lord Lieutenant and the, the DLs who uh, do these uh, presentation events really, uh, you know, embrace the whole es essence of it. And it's really good for the local community. But outstanding groups cannot win unless they're nominated. So the message, you know, the message from all of us today is please, please go away from here and uh, try and do something about that. Next slide, please. Um, this is the Chelmsford model. Is Duncan here? There's Duncan. Right. Duncan Lumley, when he was the mayor of Chelmsford, decided to do something a little bit different. He started up by forming a little group. Or I actually listened to Jenny uh, telling local authorities that they could try and do more to try and get uh, uh, nominated groups for this, this fantastic award. So he set up a small group of six local people with connections across their community, connected to the local CBS chief exec. And uh, each group member asked to nominate two possible voluntary groups. Then they look at these more closely. Next slide, please. If they like the group and they're eligible, they actually do a lot to actually facilitate the nomination. And uh, this is a, an excellent initiative. Uh, Jenny's written to, the Lord Lieutenant has written to local authority chief execs in the past with this model. But, you know, this is an, another opportunity to pick up the Chelmsford model and sort of take it to your hometown, as it were, because uh, it really is. Um, you know, we can replicate the Chelmsford model in local authority areas across the county. And it really would be a, a, an excellent way of improving our way of nominating voluntary groups. The last slide, please. Um, one of the things we're going to do after uh, today is send to every invitee a letter from the Lord Lieutenant with a pack of promotional material. We have produced in Essex a simple one page guide to what you need to do to. Um, nominate voluntary groups. It's pretty simple, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, we would ask you to really uh, seriously consider this and consider it within your networks and your organisations. Um, but you'll get all this electronically over the uh, over the next few days. Um, it's been an honour to be involved with the uh, Queen's Award, now King's Award for Voluntary Services, uh, simply because. Uh, 
as somebody who was a founder member of Essex Community Foundation and then its chairman, to work with the voluntary sector and see the contribution they make to our community is phenomenal. And to see some of these fantastic groups are rewarded with this fantastic national award is a great thing for them, a great thing for our county, and a great thing for our communities. So I would really urge you to seriously consider how we can do more to nominate more of these excellent groups. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed. Well, uh, we've heard about the, uh, the the charitable sector, the voluntary sector. Let's move on to the individual honours. And the chair of the Essex Honours Panel is Stuart Williams. Thank you, Dave. Slide, please. The Essex Honours Panel was uh, set up by the then Lord Lieutenant Lord Peter, way back in 2008, that's actually 15 years ago. And it was set up to encourage more nominations in Essex, actually in Greater Essex, in Essex, Southend and Thurrock, because actually there were too few. And it followed a government review of the honours system nationally. Now, Initially, the honours panel promoted nominations, encouraged nominations, mainly to the voluntary sector, and uh, although not exclusively. And receptions were held in a number of parts of the county as the main thrust for that promotion. Next slide, please. So it was launched at uh, Ingotstone Hall in late 2008, and then it was followed by uh, the receptions. Um, we tried to cover four the four quarters of the county. So it was Harlow, Chelmsford, Colchester, South End. Um, sadly, we didn't get to the east, but uh, we did hold a, another reception uh, in, uh, in Chelmsford at the City Racecourse. Now, these receptions actually, as for Quabs, were actually funded, sponsored by uh, the uh, Essex County Council Chairman. And they were managed, and I say managed, very effectively and very efficiently by the Essex Community Foundation. Next slide, please. And the results. Well, these are the results, and the arrows point to those years when we held receptions. And you can see that from 2009, there was a, apart from one little blip, um, a steady increase in the number of recipients for honors, not nominations. These were recipients for individual honors. And you've heard Abby has mentioned the, uh, the awards and medals, which can be, uh, can be, uh, can be given uh, as part of the honours process. Um, as I said, the last reception was in 2016, and sadly since then, whilst we've been undertaking some um, promotional activity, uh, there has been a levelling off, a levelling off of the uh, um, results. Sadly, I can't tell you if there have been more nominations. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm, I'm unable to get any up-to-date uh, data on nominations from the Cabinet Office at this stage. I hope, and I'm told, that that will be available, that information will be available in the future. Uh, next slide, please. Now, in any marketing and promotional activity, you need to know that if what you're doing is successful, so we do look at a little bit of analysis, fairly simple analysis. And this is a, a, an Excel sheet, which we, which we uh, keep updated to show actually just how many uh, awards are given each year in each of the uh, honors rounds um, and the, the, the type of the level of the award, whether it be BEM or knighthood. Um, we also include, of course, some of the other um, awards. Uh, there's a list for CAVs, 
um, uh, King's Medals um, and uh, Gallantry Awards. Interestingly, we also do uh, an analysis of those awards actually, which are given to Essex people, but whose contribution is outside of the county. Now, if you look at this list, you will see actually that in general, in general, they say, on most, more than 50% of the individual honors which are given each year are for a contribution or for a service or for work outside of the county. It's just that the recipients live in Essex. And this actually is a familiar story in what was called, if you anybody remembers, the home counties. So actually it would be those often um, public staff who live in a county, but who work in London. It could be actually that uh, uh, somebody lives in, in Essex and actually has a contribution made in Northumberland. So whilst the, those results I showed you in the previous slide look quite interesting, they actually are not reflective of the contribution of individuals' work in Essex. And as has been said, that's why we need to increase the number of nominations for those individuals whose contribution is to Essex and Essex communities and Essex society. Next slide, please. So following on from that, just look at the annual average, annual awards, individual honors given over the last 10 years. Actually, it's 53. You know, actually, that doesn't sound a great deal. And considering Greater Essex, well, you can see the number. Yep, at Greater Essex has a population now of 1 million, oh, over 1,800,000. So we could do better. Next slide, please. I said actually that we'd held receptions as a main thrust of the promotion, but as CAVS has done, we've actually produced a short guide to public honours. There we are. <laughs> um, and indeed, over the last couple of years, there have been two honours promotional brochures produced by the Essex Association of Local Councils. And the latest one is that. And Peter Davey, who is chair of the Essex Association of Local Councils, is here today. And Peter, thank you for that initiative, because that is a brochure which has been sent out to more than 400 parish councils. And that's an initiative to try to encourage them to make nominations. In 2021, there was a promotional video produced by the County Council. I don't intend to show it to you now because obviously that needs updating. Um, and we also have asked civic leaders, yes, some of you among are here, to actually talk about honours. And indeed, current County Council Chairman, Councillor Jill Reeves, did so um, quite recently at her garden party. So thank you, Chair. Um, and that actually is important. So can I encourage all civic leaders actually to whenever they make a speech, mention the honours. Actually, also mention CAVs and also mention the King's Award for Enterprise because these are all recognition for all those, for communities and for businesses in your area. Next slide, please. Now, other promotional materials, there is actually a leaflet or was a leaflet produced by the cabinet office, which is this um, called Do the Honours. Interestingly enough, actually, our campaign logo back in 2009 was called Do the Honours for Essex. Hmm. Um, sadly, this is needs updating now, so isn't available. Um, but I, I have been told that it is being updated 
uh, and will be available soon. Oh, and by the way, actually, I don't want to embarrass Abby, but actually she she produced this leaflet when she was in the cabinet office. So thank you. <laughs> um, and, uh, but to keep up to date with promotions, um, we've also undertaken some social media work. Thank you. Uh, with three assets, sorry, three, three images, one, two, three, which actually um, Deputy Lieutenant David Hurst is, has initially just asked for uh, other DLs to uh, distribute to their circle. So, um, but I'm sure these can be available to anyone who wants to produce more. They each all link to the Essex Lieutenancy website. Um, and it's the page actually, which uh, is for individual honours. And there is a fourth asset, a, sorry, can we go back? Thank you. There is a fourth asset, um, which also is available. And again, which links to the Essex Lieutenancy website, um, individual honours page. Again, to try to encourage more nominations. Thank you, next. Well, let's just actually have a little recap of why honours are awarded. Um, and it's fairly, fairly simple in a, in a way. Yes, for long-term voluntary service, for innovation and entrepreneurship, changing things, achievements, improving people's lives, and actually displaying moral courage. Now, these, the, 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 these are the elements which certainly are in the, 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 national, um, the national motive for giving honours. Next slide, please. Now, we've all heard, we've all asked you to make nominations for whatever um, award. So, but how do you do it actually? Now, for stakeholders, there's a direct route. And Abby, actually, you will have heard um, notes that, uh, sorry, it's not that one, but nevertheless, um, has mentioned and shown actually that, uh, that form, which is a similar form which will be shown to or be sent to stakeholders. I mean by stakeholders, local authorities. Um, local authorities, um, public organisations such as health authorities, um, a, a justice services, um, and uh, and those government departments, local government departments. And those organisations will hear directly from the appropriate government department about the honours process. So it could well be, I think DCMS will link with whatever, but certainly Department of Leveling Up will is, is local authorities, I think, Abby, yes. So if there are local authority chief execs here, then you will hear from the uh, Department of Leveling Up and whatever else they are now um, about the honours process. And of course, you know, there are, there are people who work with, in local authorities who actually do a lot, probably outside of their local authority work. For deputy lieutenants too, there is a direct route. Um, there, is a, there, there is a guidance available for that. Um, can we just add on the uh, citation form? And there is actually a Lord Lieutenant nomination form which you can use. And again, it's a, it's a direct route. There are, there are terms and conditions to that, by the way. But certainly for Deputy Lieutenants, you can use that. Public nominations, um, usually via the website that's the government website which abby has uh, has mentioned earlier or actually there's the uh, cabinet office website can next slide please so the this is the uh, the cabinet office website can i just say that if you do go to the cabinet office website i'll give you the uh, address the next slide there is actually a very commendable history of orders and medals and uh, I, would, uh, I would suggest if you wish to know more about the honours system to have a look at that website. So if you go on to the next slide um, and you'll see the cabinet office uh, address there to look at uh, the how to make nominations. These are public nominations, by the way. 
um, and also the uh, Essex Lieutenancy website, again, which does have um, pages and information and advice about how to make nominations. Next slide, please. Now, when you're making a nomination, there's a very little word with a big impact here. And that word is metrics, measurements. Give numbers and figures. And the Lord Lieutenant will know this because it's something which actually, uh, having sat on the sifting committees, which Abby mentioned, she will know that these are looked at quite critically. So while you show that uh, what a nominee has achieved, and while you give examples of outstanding quality, while you show positive change, the difference and the contribution which that work has made, you need to measure it. It's critical to measure it. It's critical to give the numbers and the figures. You need to quantify outcomes, certainly where possible. It's no good saying that the nominee is a good person and has done lots of good works. What has he or she achieved? How many people have benefited? How much money has been raised? What's it been used for? A whole list of questions, but quantify the outcomes where possible. Don't forget the word metrics. You need to give numbers and figures. You need to give a measurement. Without them, the nomination is likely to fail. Next slide, please. We've mentioned medals, and I cannot end this short presentation without speaking about the King's Medals, King's Fire Service Medal, King's Ambulance Service Medal. Because whilst these don't get as much publicity as ordinary birthday honours or New Year honours, they are important. They are part actually of the honours system. And while in general, there aren't any public nominations through this route because it's down to those services to make those individual nominations. They are part of the national UK honours system and should actually be given more publicity. And that is it. Thank you very much indeed for listening. Right, now it's your turn. Um, we have our question and answer session now, and we have, um, I, I suggest all five of our speakers are up for grabs, so to speak, if you'd like to ask a question on any of the points that have been raised this afternoon. If you'd like to ask Alex anything about uh, the voluntary awards, if you'd like to ask Abby anything about the individual awards, uh, Keith about awards for enterprise, or Charles or Stuart about what we're doing here in Essex and what we can do to improve what we're doing here in Essex. So who'd like to start us off? It's like school, isn't it? Yes. Well, if you could push the thing. Yes. Um, a, a question for um, Abby, please. Once one's uh, submitted a nomination for uh, an award, how long do we wait until we say, ah, oh, they haven't got it? Because one is always asked uh, that question. Um, yeah, so once you it takes about uh, 12 to 18 months. So if your nomination goes straight to cabinet office, it takes about 12 to 18 months before they um, assess the case and then sent to government departments. So what I would suggest was if you're going to put in a nomination for, say, for example, I don't know, for a charitable fundraiser, you can send that directly to us in DCMS. So that will take, it will speed things up a little bit because then that will 
take away the bottleneck of it going to cabinet office or like a post box and then they will who will then send it to us so if you're quite clear as to what your nominee your, your nominee is doing if it's something very obvious you know a teacher um fundraiser send it direct to the government department and then Shall I say who we are? Yeah. Right, um, I'm Kevin Davey. I'm the chair of the Essex Association of Local Councils. Um, Alex, when I was listening to your presentation with interest, uh, being very positive about uh, encouraging these awards, uh, I think you mentioned the local assessment, but I can't remember the number of pages they had to fill in on that assessment. Was it 90? By any chance? Um, it is quite a few, I can say that. Uh, this does also contain, contain help text. So for every question, kind of um, it outlines what we're looking for, what kind of information you need to ask. We are constantly revising that form, shall we say, to ensure that it uh, doesn't take up kind of too much of your time. But it's a real balance with ensuring that because the national assessors will have no knowledge of the group because they're all around the UK. So they need to kind of, um, that's all the information that will be given. So we need to ensure that it's in depth. So can I just come back and say, um, it was an internal process within the whole structure of the on nominations of honours, whereby they're doing their own internal audit on the process on a regular basis to encourage more people to put forward the nominations by reducing the number of forms they have to complete. Thank you. Um, the actual uh, nomination in the first place is quite simple and straightforward. It's website. It can be relatively short. So the initial nominator has only got to fill in a very short uh, uh, amount of detail. Um, the, it's, it's interesting. I, I've been doing this for 13 years, and uh, the first uh, set of uh, assessment forms were probably about four or five pages. Uh, each year, invariably, as Alex said, they revise the, their uh, assessment. So, you know, you get things added that are uh, lo locally fashionable, inclusivity, diversity, uh, and a whole range of other things. So the, 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 it's not unusual for a, a, a final assessment to be about 14 pages long, but that's done by our panel. And um, the visit by the two assessors invariably takes up to four hours um, and uh, our assessors uh, come away filled with enthusiasm about the groups in, uh, that they sit down with and our, our job is to get the rich picture of what these groups are about um, but assessments uh, not uncommonly of 14 pages and then You've got this 600 word citation at the end, which is the Lord Lieutenant citation, that I think is really important. And that's why we asked Stuart to give it a once over from a sort of an editorial press type perspective, because, you know, he's used to writing things that are quite impactive. Over the years, we've got, you know, fewer and fewer sort of uh, crossings out and additions. So uh, we're getting used to writing what we need to write. But, uh, it's a very thorough assessment, that local assessment. Thank you very much. By implication, are you, sir, are you suggesting that might, people might be put off nominating people because of the complexity of the whole thing? Yeah, um, Jenny and I have, uh, and Stuart, have formed a what I call a very simplistic approach through the Essex Association to get it down to the grassroots so they are aware of the process and how simple it can be. But I, I still feel that um, the process can be re-looked at on a regular basis because, as you're suggesting, it does expand for various reasons, for all the understandable reasons. But I don't think anyone actually steps back from it and says, well, just a minute, you know, this was X pages long, it's now Y pages long. Are we encouraging or discouraging nominations? Thank you. Uh, businesses change and so can, and organizations change. So I can see that a five-year award for a Queen's Award for and Queen's Award for Enterprise makes good sense. Why is it then that it's a lifetime award for 
a charity or a voluntary organization with CAVs? Um, yes. Sure, that's a great question. Um, so when CAVs was set up, my understanding is that it was done within the honor system. So naturally with individual honors, you are awarded them for life. So in a similar way, um, kind of the Queen's award was given for life. There is um, okay, a review of this, shall we say, or there is kind of work in the background to kind of determine whether this is kind of correct, whether this should continue, whether actually we need to kind of remain aware of groups changing because naturally they evolve with the voluntary sector and in time. Um, but if we are to kind of put a limit, then we would therefore have to ask the question, should it be moved out of kind of the national honour system? And hence, would that potentially damage kind of the reputation of the award in some way? So to put it simply, it was kind of set up within the honour system and hasn't been changed since. So are you saying, well, the should be I don't think it should be for five years, but I'm sure that there should be a time limit on it. Thank you, uh, Chairman Ed Parsons and the Chairman for Epping Forest District Council. Um, thank you very much for the presentations. I was just wanted to um, ask um, a question to Abby or perhaps Alex in relation to the number of applications for nominations that have been put in. Um, from, from the applications being put in paper format, form filling, as opposed to online, have you seen an increase or decrease or the, or the numbers have been the same? Thank you. So uh, for individual honours, we still get, I say we, because I worked in cabinet office, we, we get a fair few number of paper nominations coming in, but now we're finding that people are using a lot more of the online system. And in DCMS, we don't get any, well, we rarely get paper nominations now. It's all online. Thank you very much. Uh <laughs> Hello, John Hall. Um, Alex and Abby, I think both spoken from the Department of Culture, Media and Sport. Uh, now, I know that other departments are also dealing with applications, the Department of Environment, for example, or DEFRA. So how many different departments are dealing with uh, nominations for? So every single government department has an honours secretariat, so I, I I don't know the number of government departments, That's thousands, yeah. yeah. So, but DCMS is the biggest contrib contributor in Whitehall to honours, well, obviously because of the remit of the department, culture, media, sports. Mother Chairman, it was very good presentation. Thank you very much indeed. Would it be possible for us to have access to the overheads um, because obviously we scouted the through through them pretty quickly and it would be usable to be able to go back and have a look at them. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, Nicholson, Chair of Essex Community Foundation. Just to uh, the longevity of the, the CAVS Award. Um, I, I think I completely understand why, as part of the honor system, it, it should last or could last, uh, you know, for a very long time. On the other hand, Alex, you, you were making the point it's a quality mark, and I think there's quite a big issue there because um, the quality of, of voluntary groups is a really important thing to keep an eye on. And if we're saying it's a quality mark, then I think it doesn't doesn't really sit very comfortably with with uh, it being forever. My, my my main question was what to invite you perhaps to unpack. A little bit about the volunteer led. Um, I know Charles lent on the point that almost every charity is going to be voluntary led because the trustees are all volunteers by definition. But I think you said twice the group should be voluntary led. And indeed, on the website, I was just looking at it, it encourages volunteer led groups. The reality is many of our very best community and voluntary groups and charities are led by very experienced professionals, um, fantastic people who then engage age huge numbers of volunteers to do a fantastic work. I think it may be nuancing a little bit about what we mean by volunteer-led. Uh, I think that could be something that could be quite usefully unpacked a bit. And I, perhaps you and, you and Charles could have a quick debate about it now. I'd quite enjoy it. Thank you.
Um, yeah, that is a great question. I think I think volunteer led is at the crux of what CAVS is. So, it, in my understanding, it's about a group which is uh, where the volunteers are leading the strategy, where they're leading the delivery, where they are involved in kind of the policies. Can I just sure. clarify where they are in the delivery? Yes. Um, the strategy where they have an understanding of kind of the policies and they are found at all levels of the hierarchy of an organization. Um, volunteer boards slash trustees are um, an interesting one, shall we say, uh, and they are constantly up for dispute by our national committee every year as to kind of the levels of engagement when we have kind of paid chief executives where we have um, trustee boards. Um, I'm, I'm kind of not answering your question here very well. Um, <laughs> um, but I, th I think um, are volunteers integral to the group? Are they involved in what the group is doing, and are they lead and are they kind of leading that direction of the group? I think is kind of really the core question. And then if it gets to a stage where there are kind of paid chief executives, there are paid staff and quite high ratio, aka 50% paid staff, 50% volunteers, or there are kind of trustee board and then kind of paid staff maybe delivering, then I fully encourage anybody to kind of get in touch with us. And if if I don't know, because again, I'm kind of a civil servant, not so a volunteer expert. It's a number step, you know, in many ways. Um, I, th I think... Um, I, mean, I think when it comes to paid staff and volunteer staff, there needs to be more volunteers than there's paid staff. Paid staff, paid staff are completely allowed because we understand that there are specialist roles, such as in a hospice, for example, that need to be delivered. Um, but um, if, if there are any issues, then I can say that it is. Um, I might come back yeah, in sure. a second. Uh, this is uh, a, a tricky issue. We recognise, I think, the difficulty of making decisions nationally, uh, and uh, but very often the, the local panel feels pretty frustrated by the outcome of some of these. Um, there's no, this is not, a, there's no appeal process in this. But we have one example where uh, Essex uh, Police Special Constabulary were nominated. They have 550, or they did it then. 550 volunteers doing fantastic work. Um, they've massively increased their numbers because of the initiative of, of, of uh, uh, the way they change their sort of uh, approach to volunteering. Um, and they had a, uh, a group led by a paid police superintendent. Um, she was outstanding in, in her own right. But all the rest of the management group were special consuls themselves, volunteers. And uh, we, we submitted that with, you know, the highest recommendation we could, which is only recommended. At one time, you could say highly recommended or recommended, but now it's just recommended or not recommended. And uh, it came back uh, saying, um, even though they passed the first eligibility check, which it happens in, in the uh, DCMS office, uh, came back saying not eligible. Well, it just so happened that two years previously, Kent Special Constabulary had got the award, and two years before that, Greater Manchester Special Constabulary got the award. So even though there's no appeal process, the Lord Lieutenant um, wrote back to uh, uh, the National Committee and pointed this out. And um, this volunteer-led aspect, they were saying an organisation such as that can't be volunteer-led because it's part of a larger organisation. But in a sense, they rescinded it and they gave the award the following year. But that this is something, uh, you know, we could we have a great relationship with um, uh, the national office and we recognise the difficulties. But some of the criteria you know, sometimes don't always make sense, but then, you know, that's life, isn't it? So um, we have to put up with that. But part of it is in how you write it up. So, you know, we, we have got an experienced group of uh, assessors who realise that that's a, uh, a, an issue that we must overcome if they're going to stand any chance of getting the award. 
So we work hard to make sure we try and really emphasize the volunteer led aspect of how each of these group is run. Um, I mean, Saffron Hall volunteer, uh, volunteers is one that's in, in the, the pot now. The first application, the first uh, response to the questionnaire showed that there are 400 volunteers, front of house people doing fantastic work. Didn't mention the fact they've got a voluntary board that sort of drives everything. They've got a fantastic chief exec as well. But nevertheless, you know, you have to find the balance in there to meet the criteria. Um, next. Uh, following on from that, I would just like to ask Alex and Abby, please, about feedback. Having been involved in a number of applications over the years, uh, most of which have been successful, there were two cases that stick in my, my mind, one for the QAVS, as was one for an individual on it, which to my mind were outstanding. And I'm reasonably confident, thanks to the contribution of others, that they were quite well presented and written, uh, that neither of them uh, were successful. And the feedback, I would say, was opaque uh, in the extreme. And I was wondering whether the feedback might not be made rather more comprehensive to guide us for the future. Yeah, so um, in terms of individual honours, we we get it in the neck from nominators and so we go back to cabinet office because obviously they are responsible for the honor system and we tell them that we need more comprehensive feedback i mean one-on-one -on -one, when i deal with my stakeholders and other nominators if i see their nomination initially i can give them the feedback then before it, it actually goes to committee and say you need to strengthen this because this will stand no chance but it's something, you know, that's something, you know, we always encounter when we do any outreach and we keep feeding back to cabinet office that they need to give us something more concrete that we can give nominators. So what get I keep getting told the same thing that, yes, we'll do, you know, we'll do better. But to be yeah. fair, I have sat in on committees and say, so for example, on my committees, community voluntary service, they look at over 700 nominations and they're not able to go through every single one and give comprehensive feedback. So that's why I'm there as an observer and I can take what I can from the discussions and give that back to nominators. Okay, Alex, what would you say about that one? Regarding uh, CAVs, we are happy to provide feedback. We will not give you explicit reasons why a group may or may not have been successful because that would be kind of uh national assessors comments who are confidential and made a kind of an honest subgroup committee and i think it'd be wrong to offer that um but after kind of an awardee list has been published we are kind of happy to set up a meeting with myself or kind of and give um general comments as to kind of the strengths and weaknesses maybe to individual groups Thank you. Thank you, Anthony and Nick, for wonderful presentations. Um, on the question of being volunteer-led, volunteer comments goes back to this, actually, from the time it was just asked. Um, and I think, in many senses, that it's about a degree of autonomy uh, amongst the activities of the volunteers. So uh, my example is a, um, a very large hospice in the south of the county, which I went to uh, do the assessment on. And um, I, I, I mean, it is fantastic, but there are hospices everywhere. And I didn't actually think we would have a strong chance, but they didn't get it. And I think it was because we were able to say that this group of volunteers were that more remarkable, but they were self-led. When you find into the activities of the hospice, actually, the hospice couldn't work without them. But um, it, it, you know, th this was the point. And I don't know whether that, that's a valid observation or not. So, the, so the, the importance of the volunteers to the outcomes for the beneficiaries? Yes, and because they were, they were, they, they, they were self led. Uh, yes, I, I completely agree with that. I think um, one thing you said as well was that if you took away the volunteers and the group wouldn't be able to operate. And I uh, yeah, strongly agree with that point that actually that's a really good 
sort of marker almost of how a group is kind of operating and how important the volunteers are kind of to delivering but also leading right Uh, thank you, Dave. Um, first of all, I just want to say what you must have the most difficult job in the world to be able to assess those applications and uh, take my hat off to you all. I'm Sharon Alexander. I'm CVS tendering, no relation to Cabinet Office CVS. And um, I, my, my point was related to Peter Davies earlier, where um, the um, query was about the number of pages because we were most privileged, our, our volunteers were most privileged to have been nominated for a Queen's Award for Voluntary Service. We weren't successful, no hard feelings, um, but, um, you know, the, the process for the volunteers, uh, uh, very, very easy to nominate a group easiest thing in the world because I think it's only a, a page uh, it was one of our organizations that I remember that nominated us uh, that they, they observed our volunteers and the hard work that they did and felt that they deserved a, a nomination and um, that they really were uh, they saved lives but um, that that 48 questions, I think there were, 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 was arduous for them and took them days, you know, to go through it. And maybe if that could be reviewed and, and, uh, you know, cut in places, it, it would make it easier for the, the organization. Thank you. No, 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 exactly. And so the nomination form is really, really simple. And we've tried to make it as basic as possible just to get nominations in, just to get kind of a flavour of what the group is doing. With regards to the local assessment form, um, yeah, I completely empathise with that. It is quite long and it does cover an awful lot. And it is just take both the lieutenancy and the nominated group quite a long time to go through it. We are constantly revising that. It is a real battle between getting enough information from the group, but also enough information for the national assessors because they will look at it just on face value. They won't know the group. You know, it may be kind of one in Northern Scotland that they have no idea about kind of the location, the context, the rurality, et cetera. So we are kind of trying to find that balance. And um, But it's really kind of, uh, thank you for, I guess, uh, commenting that it does take a bit of time. Okay. The questionnaire that gets sent there is, is our innovation. Um, but uh, it, it mirrors all the stuff that we were asked to have the answers to. So the only place we can get that is from the group. Um, and one of the best ways to do that is get it in written form. I, mean, I can recall Jenny and I, when we first started this, went to a voluntary group um, and we, we didn't used to have the questionnaire. We used to tell them that, you know, we're going to turn up at whatever it was. And we were confronted by uh, uh, probably about 20 people um, sat around a table all have had a bit different story to tell us about the ones of this group and uh, so the only way to sort of get this honed down into something that's going to be of value when you're trying to respond to a national um, uh, assessment process is to ask the group to you know give us a fair amount of information in writing and then we say in the questionnaire frontage, what we'd like to do is spend like an hour with maybe one or two people who can tell us about the finances and that sort of stuff. And then have a wider group of some of the volunteers and maybe some of the people who deliver the services and so on and so forth. So uh, I apologise if you feel that's a, a bit lengthy, but that's the sort of stuff we have to respond to. Okay. Different topic. A question I think mainly for Abby about naming. A lot of the individual awards include the word empire. I wondered if there was any move to change the names and um, perhaps reduce the risk of the whole system looking rather um, historic and anachronistic even. I think, um, so cabinet officer are aware. So for every time an honours list is published, you get 2% of people refusing. And most people don't give a reason for refusing, but some people do refuse because of the word empire. Now, being an ethnic minority, um, it's something I feel very passionate about as well. 
but it's something cabinet officers are aware of. And before um, Her Majesty sadly passed away last year, it was something that, that was being looked at, but she was resistant to change because obviously I think her grandfather set up the order of the British Empire. But I know it's one of the things cabinet officers are talking to the king about. I'm not quite sure where they are in terms of like the discussion, but it is something that's being looked at. Hi, uh, Tim Gosher. Um, unfortunately, they would not be eligible. Their primary work has to be based in the UK and a secondary benefit can be based abroad, but they have to be primarily based and working in the UK. Sorry, can I, can I add to that? So are you thinking of um, nominating the group or specific individuals in the group? Because you can still nominate people that are based overseas but it just means it goes to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Uh, could be either. Um, could be either. Okay, I mean, for individual honours, the fact that they're based overseas does not discount them at all. I mean, we can have a conversation about that if you want offline. But yes, just to repeat what uh, Abby has said, actually, there is the uh, Overseas and Commonwealth list, actually, which is published alongside the uh, Prime Minister's uh, honours lists. Um, and that does reflect, actually, the contribution individuals make overseas. Indeed, um, just I think last year, Jenny, there was an award given to somebody who lived in Essex who actually worked extensively overseas, and that was a higher level award. Okay. Sorry. Um, you, let, let's make it clear. Actually, you cannot um, nominate an individual for a specific award. So you cannot put forward people for a specific level of honour. Um, on the direct route for for, for uh, deputy lieutenants, the form goes to the Lord Lieutenant, who can make a recommendation. I believe. But it's not actually, it's, it is literally only a recommendation. So you, 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 sorry, you can't do it. Okay, uh, Thank you, uh, John Griffith Jones, DL. Um, I seem to recall about maybe two or three years ago, there was a suggestion that there was an overlay of um, geographical attributes on the county as to whether or how many calves or crabs in those days awards you've got so deprivation uh, and diversity uh, and essex in general is you know quite affluent and not terribly diverse and there was some sense that we had to create in our submissions uh, some statistic that that got us over this particular hurdle my real question is is this true and isn't it a bit unfair on the groups in Essex that are doing the good works they are in the circumstances uh, that they're trying to look after um if I'm honest this was slightly before my time um so I can't I don't know the exact circumstance um my simple answer is that every group when kind of recommended to the national committee it will be in a each sort of committee is made up of like 40 groups and there will often be kind of one group um the context is kind of really important to the group 
Um, and but every group is looked on purely on merit rather than um, kind of other characteristics. So I think what you're saying doesn't truly apply to CAVs anymore. Um, I think would be kind of a fair statement to make. So the answer is no. Yes. Thank you, Leighton Hammett from Essex, please. My questions around relatedness, and I just look at the demographic of the people in this room, and I then think about, and I include myself within that, I then think about how do we, so how do we take this forward to this group and this conversation to represent more of the people that are actually doing this great volunteering work on the ground? So I've got two questions. One's to Abby and Alex. Is there any lived experience in terms of some of the conversations that you're having at the end and the marking and the conversations around who's going to win the award. And then my second question is to Charles and your Cavs panel. What does it look like in terms of the makeup there? Have you got any youth or any young adults or is there a strategy to try to make that more diverse? Because I think sometimes the, the public look to the, the groups to see if it's something they can aspire to do or to be involved in. I don't necessarily have the answer, but I don't know if it's something as a group that we thought about in terms of trying to make this more relatable to people out there that are actually doing the work. Yeah, I'll take the one on honours. So um, there was a reform of the honours system. There have been actually a few, actually. The first one, 2003, you know, actually made membership of the honours committees more transparent. So, for example, again, I'll keep using... Um, community voluntary service because that's the committee I'm on a secretary to. Our members are independent honours committee members who are selected through open and fair competition actually go out and do outreach events like this because like you said um, you know people see who they are that they sit on committees and they know they can relate to them and that encourages people to put in nomination. Same thing with me. I pre-pandemic, I would go around and do presentations like this because I'm the visible face of honours. So people can see that, you know, I'm not some Mandarin stuck somewhere in Whitehall. I can talk to people about, you know, how to put in nominations. So um, I think it's the same for CAVs as well, how you um, get your members. Um, yeah, in terms of our national assessment committee, in terms of our National Assessment Committee, um, it's recruited by kind of fair and open recruitment, so it goes on public appointments. We have representatives from Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. Our youngest is 32, our oldest, I won't, I don't know actually how old they are, but I'm not going to make a guess. Um, and they cover all kind of spectrums of, um, kind of lived experience, um, you know, areas of kind of affluent, but also kind of deprivation and um, kind of worked experience. In terms of kind of the groups that we get as kind of um, CAVs awardees, we, again, have the whole spectrum from groups working in quite affluent areas, areas, that, areas derived, rural, urban, working with um, kind of special education needs, children, older people. So for us, we never worry about kind of hitting benchmarks or anything like that. Actually, the main thing for us is about ensuring geographical representation, ensuring that the whole of the UK and all communities are represented. Yeah, we're um, mainly uh, a, a bunch of older people, um, but uh, we are, some other counties uh, uh, have a turnover and, and have a, a period of, of time on, on the panel. We, we haven't done that. Um, because actually what has happened is, uh, because we've become more successful year on year in terms of numbers, these assessments take quite a lot uh, of time if you're going to do them properly. And you need people who can understand, uh, you know, uh, financial issues, uh, understand safeguarding, understand all the sorts of issues that, you know, we, we have to involve in here. And they also have to be able to write a very reasonable and quite punchy assessment. So, um, but uh, one of the things that's happening as I step down is we're just about to review and uh, think about the, the future and look at the practice in a couple of the other counties are doing really well. So uh, we're just about to set up a little group about that. So 
this would be an opportunity to maybe reflect on whether there's uh, scope in here for some younger, younger assessors um, uh, and that sort of thing. But, um, you know, to get to do the best for the group, you need competent people who can write competent reports. And, uh, uh, and by and large, our, our panel has been made up of, of those sorts of people. But uh, I think it's a very interesting uh, take. And uh, just as we're about to set up a small group to start looking to the future, Tim Stokes, who you may know, is going to take over from me. Um, he's sat up there. Um, and uh, so he, he will, uh, you know, we, we, we'll, we'll look at that, that sort of thought. But it's, it's a very interesting perspective. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Uh, Charles Thomas, dear, I was, with apologies for bringing the level of uh, question crashing down. But to qualify a question earlier, could all the presentations please be made available, perhaps on the Lieutenancy website? Yes. Thank you. So again, um, Cabinet Office will, nominators will contact Cabinet Office if that's where they've sent their nomination to. And then Cabinet Office will tell individuals if the nomination hasn't been successful. Like I said, it takes between 12 to 18 months. If Cabinet Office have sent a case to another government department, they will contact us, for example, in DCMS to ask us what's happening with the case. And then we then give feedback to cabinet office who will then feed back to you, the nominator. Or in some instances, they'll actually tell the nominator that the case has gone to DCMS, here are their contact details. Then you know we can give you that feedback directly. But it takes between 12 to 18 months for any nomination to come through. So that's so you will get something that months. If you if you ask for it. They will not, Cabinet Office will not go out and tell nominators that the nomination hasn't been successful. Did, did everyone hear that? Because that was a very important point. Well, no, that was what I wanted just to be absolutely clear about, because in the past I thought, I thought that inquiry had to go through the Lord Lieutenant. But an individual can actually make that inquiry. Just finish. Um, I don't know whether Brian was asking for more than uh, just a yay or nay. That, is that all it was? Uh, okay, fine. Yeah, no, so the answer to the first question would be great. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, Cabinet Office are moving away from not giving any feedback now to trying to give feedback. And they, they can either do it through you, the Lord Lieutenant, or if the nominator goes to the Cabinet Office directly to ask, then Cabinet Office will either tell them it's gone to a government department or tell them to um, go to the Lord Lieutenant. And we go home. Thank you very much, Dave. Well, I just want to say thank you to everybody, actually. Everybody who's here has got some interest and in some part to play or is already playing a really major part. So, um, I, I must thank Alex and uh, Abby for coming up uh, to see us today, coming across actually, it's not really up. Uh, um, it's been tremendous and, and it's acted as a, a magnet to get us all together and, and have actually just recent, just in the closing moments, useful discussion, I think. So thank you very much indeed. I'd like to thank Keith very much 
for his uh, presentation on the uh, King's Award for Enterprise, um, all very, very clear. And I must really congratulate him. He was busy congratulating everybody else, but he has been fantastic and demonstrated huge leadership, uh, bringing together all the various people who uh, could add to our um, celebration of our brilliant businesses. Um, Charles Clark, and I'll come back to him. Um, <laughs> Stuart, thank you very much indeed for all the work that you do on the honours. Uh, you've been an absolute stalwart, and I know you've been very much part of putting this together. Yes, Charles, I'm going to go off piece here a bit, because Charles is coming to the end of his term, and he has been quite remarkable. You can see from the way he speaks, he feels about this very, very strongly. And... Uh, uh, and the, the proof is that he's, he's done wonderfully well and has developed a very good dialogue with, uh, with the office in London. And um, so thank you, Charles, for everything you've done. Um, Duncan Lumley also. Thank you, Duncan. You, you stepped up right at the beginning and your um, enthusiasm in, and the way in which you addressed how a local authority can help uh, is a model. And I'm just so pleased to see a few um, mayors and chairs here today. Thank you very much, because actually you are the way in. You are a really key way into our communities. So if we talk about diversity, <clears throat> you are the way to reach, help reach them. Um, you might be comforted to know that actually, uh, you know, I do a lot of validations of honours, um, depending, and I get help by my DLs. Um, and a number of those that are going forward, they may or may not be successful, are actually from um, a, a wide, di diverse um, number of people in the community. Um, finally, no, not quite finally, but in terms of individuals, I'm going to go off piste here because I want to use this opportunity to thank Dave Monk, uh, firstly for today, because you, know, you can see his skills as a broadcaster who likes to get into the subject properly and uh, remembers everything, um, but also to thank him publicly for the incredible service he's given to Essex, uh, working for BBC Essex. It's coming to an end at the end of this week. Uh, it, it, Dave, it is remarkable, your interest in the individual person, your interest in volunteer, you've just been doing a whole series on volunteers, is second to none. Um, I'm so pleased you're a DL. You will go on be doing doing this sort of thing, I'm sure, um, interacting with the public and uh, with Red. So, uh, as you leave today, I'll ask you to take away a letter from me, urging you to take action for the honours towards identifying outstanding individuals outstanding voluntary groups and outstanding companies who need to be put forward to be considered for prestigious national honours. And I must stress, though, that it's not about quantity, it's about quality. Um, we will also send you electronically promotional material and guidance to help to take action. I've just spotted John Aldridge down there, and he has been another key person in fostering um, our, our progress. So thank you all very much indeed. We want huge numbers now. We want to recognize our wonderful people who work in our communities. Thank you. And uh, I have just been told that all the proceedings this afternoon are on Essex County Council's Democracy Channel on YouTube. So uh, you can access the whole thing on YouTube after a short time on the Essex County Council Democracy.